Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann, and I pastor the Spring Church here in Lawrence, just a few minutes up the road off of 221. And I myself and John, my friend, come out here this, this morning to bring to you the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, to proclaim to you the gospel of grace that there is forgiveness of sin, when someone believes upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're here to say that there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. He is King, friends. He is Lord. He reigns over the universe. And all power, all glory, all honor belongs unto Him. And no man can thwart His rule. No man can obliterate His kingdom. No man can resist the continuation and the expansion of His kingdom. For He is the God who is in the heavens and He does whatever He pleases. We are here, friends, to call out sin and to warn you about sin. To warn you about your sins before God, that you have to contend with God, that you must deal with the Holy One, that the day of your death is approaching soon and you will stand before God. One day, my friends, you will stand before the Holy One. And you will be judged for your sins. And the only way that this judgment can be escaped, the only way the wrath of God can be avoided, the only way a sinner can be saved, out of the hands of an angry God is if God Himself saves the sinner. And so friends, we're ultimately out here to preach monergism, that is, God working for His own glory to save sinners. And it is exclusively found in Jesus Christ. There is not multiple ways There are not multiple paths to God. There is one way to God. Jesus Himself said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. Friends, it is a sobering reality that there are few who find the way to life. And it is our hope, it is our hope this afternoon that as we're out here for the purpose of sharing the good news with you, that you would be one of those few, that you'd be counted amongst those who are in Christ, who are wrapped in the righteousness of Christ and justified on the basis of His merit, And ultimately, it is to glorify God that we are out here this morning, to bring glory to God as we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, as the preached Word goes forth. It is our desire that God would be glorified as His Son is exalted. And we know and trust that He surely will be wherever the Gospel is preached. So friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this morning is found in the book of Romans. It is found in Romans chapter 3 in, at, the, at the last part of verse 20. And Paul the Apostle here is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And he writes these words. He says, For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And that is the issue that I would like to deal with before you this morning. That God's law is given to bring us to a proper knowledge of our sin. To bring us to a proper understanding of our rebellion before God. We ask ourselves, how can we know what sin is? How can we know... What is that which God sees as evil and perverse in His sight? Well, this text answers the question. We must go 
to the law of God. And so that is ultimately what I want to consider this morning. Before we go to this text specifically, I want to briefly note on where Paul has come from and where he is going here in chapter 3 of Romans. And he is dealing with the issue of man's fallenness, man's sin before God. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. He is dealing here in Romans 3 with the fact that both Jew and Gentile, all people are found having broken God's law. In fact, he says in verse 9 of this chapter, he says, What then are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And then he gives a lengthy quotation out of the Old Testament concerning the fallenness of man. Then he says in verse 19, now, whatever, now we know that whatever the law speaks, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. So Paul here says we are all accountable to God through His law, and that none of us by keeping His law can earn a right standing with Him. Because we ourselves are fallen, are imperfect. Much worse than imperfect, we are vile wretches. And that is why we need a Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I plead with you to embrace Christ and to flee your sin and to flee to the Savior. To believe that He died and satisfied the wrath of God against sin and that He was raised on the third day. That the Father exalted Him at His right hand in glory after He had made purification for sin. And so right after that text I just read, that brings us right to the end of verse 20, which is what I want to consider, that God's law brings us to a knowledge of sin. He says, for through the law, through the law, God's law, my friends, the holy law of God, the hammer of God's law is there to show us our sin. It is to shatter our pride, to obliterate our self-righteousness before God. No man can enter God's kingdom with an ounce of pride upon his shoulders. No man can enter into God's kingdom if he thinks that he is good enough to enter into it. The law of God must run its due course in his life. The law of God must have its intended effect upon his heart. It must break him, friends. If you yourselves have not been broken by the weightiness of God's holy character as it is revealed in his law, then you know not the love of Christ. You know not the Lord Jesus Christ. You may very likely be someone who attends church be someone who is religious, who has the outward, wor outward trappings of religion upon their life. However, the law of God has never convicted you and convinced you of your fallenness before Him. You have never taken a good long look into the law of God, beheld the mirror of it, as it were, and saw that you yourself are covered in the mire of iniquity. See, friends, we must understand what we deserve for our sin before we can see what God has done for sinners in Christ. We must understand what we rightly deserve to be poured out on us in eternity, in hell, my friends, before we can see that the Son of God has purchased redemption for His people we will only understand God's grace as far as we have seen His holy wrath. And that is why the law of God is necessary. That is why the law of God is first and foremost for us to see our sin. 
Oftentimes people will say, Lucas, you need to simply preach on God's grace and God's love. And I agree that I ought to make known the riches of God's grace as they are revealed in Christ. But I must be faithful to the full counsel of God, which also speaks to the fact that God has anger. God is angry with the wicked every day. And God will punish the wicked. He will punish the evildoer. And, then on, and only then when the sinner sees their state, sees the road that they are on, not the broad, uh, not, not the narrow path, not the narrow road, but the broad path, the broad road that leads to destruction, then and only then can they see the riches of God's grace in Christ. What is the law of God, we ask ourselves? God's law, my friends, is His holy Ten Commandments. You who have grown up in church are probably familiar with God's commandments. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall honor your father and mother. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. But, oh friend, have you ever considered the fact that you have never kept these commands as God demands, as God demands of us. Have you ever considered the reality that no man can keep these commands except the man Christ Jesus, who came and fulfilled the law of God on behalf of the people of God, so that they could be credited with His law keeping, so that they could be treated as if they lived His life. For through the law, for through the law. My friends, the law of God, though it is found in the Old Testament, has not been abrogated in the New Testament. It has not been thrown to the side. In fact, rather established. Jesus Himself said, I did not come to abolish the law. Christ Jesus did not come to rid us of the commands that God gave. For they will always be a statute they will always be there for us to behold and to consider. In fact, Paul says in the book of Galatians that God's law is our tutor. It is our teacher. What does it teach us? It teaches us of our absolute inability to reconcile ourselves to God. And it teaches us that the Lord Jesus Christ is King, that He is Savior and that there is no salvation outside of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That there is no redemption outside of the shed blood of the Lamb of God. It shows us the glory of the Gospel. It points us there as a road sign, if as it were. What does the law show us? Well, Paul says, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law of God grants us knowledge, friends. It gives us knowledge. Knowledge of what? Of sin. Of sin. Sin is transgression of the law. It is failing to keep God's commands. And so that is why you must come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why you must repent and believe the Gospel. Because you yourself know that you cannot keep God's commands. You may lie against yourself. You may suppress your conscience. But you know that you have broken God's law. And that you need a Redeemer. That you need a righteousness that is not your own. That you need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so come, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. Come, you who are thirsty and have drank for free, without money, without cost. Christ Jesus said Himself, For the one who comes to Me, I will by no means cast out. He is such a gentle and gracious Savior. If it were not so, I would not plead for you to run to Him. If He cast out some of those who came to Him and accepted others, we would have no confidence to approach Him. But He Himself said, For the one who comes to Me, I will by no means cast out. Oh, my friend, are you weary? 
Are you weary of your life of sin? Are you sick of swimming in the sewer of iniquity? Friends, you need soul cleansing. You need soul purification. And that comes through the work of the Spirit of God in your life. So call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop what you're doing this day and cry out to God for mercy until He saves you. Until He raises you to spiritual life. As it says in Acts 2.20, for, no, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The law of God shows us the character of God also. For therein do we see that God does not sweep sin under the rug, that God does not simply forget about it, but that He takes notice of it, that He knows what it is, and that He has a hatred for it, that He has a detestation for it, that He abhors iniquity. And it is quite interesting that many preachers will often say, well, God hates the sin, but He loves the sinner. However, we must go to the Scriptures for the answer to this question. Psalm 5 we read, verse 4 it says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. God does hate the wicked. Now it is not what we would often conceive as hatred. For when we think of hatred, we think of something that is perverse and evil. We think of something that is sinful. However, when God has a hatred for the wicked, it is not a sinful hatred. It is not perverse. It is according to righteousness. In fact, the very definition of that word is an intense anger. There's an anger against the wicked. A burning indignation against the ungodly. And that has been removed, my friends, by the Son of God for the people of God. Christ bore the wrath and the anger and the indignation that God has against sin upon the cross. So God can pardon the wicked. God can forgive the sinner. He Himself can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. But let us not buy into the lie that is often perpetrated in pulpits in this very county in this very county that God hates the sin but loves the sinner Psalm 11 verse 5 says the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates Friends, if you know not Christ, you are a sinner in the hands of an angry God. Scripture clearly exhorts us to fear God. We must fear the Lord. We must have a holy reverence. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Friends, I fear fire. I will not go and run into a bonfire because I fear it. I know that it will burn me. We can derive heat from fires and they're very useful. However, we have to fear it. Otherwise, we will be burned. So too it is with God. We ought to fear and reverence Him and honor Him. Lest we be eternally burned. Lest we be thrown into the eternal place of tor torment for the wicked. I don't want you to go there. I wouldn't stand out here and plead with you if I did not want you to go there. Friends, I want you to have the love of God shed abroad in your heart. To have the mercy of God manifested in your life. That God would save you and adopt you as a son or a daughter of Himself through the redemptive work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is this God? Who is this God of glory? Who 
is the God who has made all things and for whose glory all things have been made. He is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One being in essence and nature, yet three eternal persons. That is the true God. And He rules and He reigns over the universe. And all things are working according to His sovereign decree. Paul speaks of the Trinity at the end of 2 Corinthians. In chapter 13, verse 14, he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul there gives a benediction and says, In effect, may the triune God, may the one true God be with you all. Friends, there are not many gods. There are not two gods or three gods. There is one God. In fact, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, we find the Shema, which is a, a very famous verse. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, He is one. Indeed, He is. And this one God ought to be feared because He is holy, as I have already mentioned. So holy is He in all His ways, righteous and just and pure. And in no way is He unrighteous or unjust. He does not pervert justice. He does not bend His law to accommodate men. But He deals justly with the children of men. Psalm 119 is very telling. In verse 137 it says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. So perfect and good is God. Many times, those of you who go to church will hear the phrase, God is good. And that is true. God in His disposition and in His dealing with the wicked is good. Even with the, the wicked, just as with the righteous. However, when I say God is good, I am not necessarily speaking of His disposition, but His moral character. That He is perfect. He is a definition of that which is right and that which is perfect. The psalmist says in Psalm 94, verse 1, he writes, O Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Render recompense to the proud. Friends, if you are prideful, you cannot enter the kingdom. God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He might exalt you at the proper time. That He might raise you to spiritual life that He might save you from your sins, that He might save you from yourself. It is by your own devices that your soul will be damned. That is why you must flee to Christ. We need salvation from ourselves, friends, from the wickedness and perversion of our own hearts, for the sin that protrudes forth out of them will bring our souls to hell. Nahum 1-2 says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. But also, what do we find? Verse 3 says, The Lord is slow to anger. Friends, God is patient with the wicked, gracious and abounding in loving kindness and mercy. 1 John 4-8 tells us that God is love. But my dear friends, God's love and God's mercy do not negate His holiness or negate His righteousness. God's attributes stand in beautiful harmony with one another, in glorious agreement. And in no way do they ever contradict.
Now we find ourselves contemplating the truth of God's law because God in His righteousness has given His law, His Ten Commandments. Those of you, as I said earlier, who have a religious background, perhaps are familiar with these commands that God gave. Jesus summarized some of them in Matthew, or excuse me, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 9. He says in verse 9, or I'm, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10, verse 19. He says, You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And these are just a few. These aren't all of God's Ten Commandments. But what are they there for? To show us the character of God, to show us the righteousness of God. For when we look at them, when we look at the command, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, these show us how God is righteous. They explain to us how He is good, how He is perfect. It is in these ways. But not only that, but they show us our sin as well. In fact, that's really what the law's purpose is. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin, as the text I just looked at earlier says. So when we consider God's commands, do not murder. And you may be quick to say, I never murdered. Jesus came along in Matthew 5 and said that if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, it is equated with murder. God sees you as a murderer. And He holds you accountable as a murderer. Do not commit adultery. You may very quickly say, I've never committed adultery. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust, or it applies to women as well, if you look at a man with lust, then you commit adultery in your heart. My friends, God sees the heart. He sees the intents of your heart. And He sees that it is wicked. And that is perverse. He does not see intrinsic goodness. He does not in see inherent righteousness. He sees your filth and your sin. Do not steal. Have you ever stolen? My friends, all thieves will be held accountable by God on the day of judgment. Do not bear false witness. Have you ever lied before? Have you lied, my friends? Then the book of Revelation tells us all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. The place of torment for the wicked. However, there is hope. There is hope for those who will humble themselves and look to Jesus Christ. So my friends, I plead with you to believe upon the Lord Christ. Jesus Christ is a sufficient and powerful and glorious Savior. And He receives all those who humble themselves and come to Him. In fact, Psalm 34.18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. How glorious is that, my friends? Those who are crushed in spirit over their sin, those who are broken over their iniquities, the Lord is near to them. The Lord is very near to them. Do you defraud others that's breaking God's law? So what is the punishment that we rightly deserve for breaking God's law? I've said it multiple times this morning. It is hell. It is a place that Jesus described as the, as the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of torment for the ungodly. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 64, or excuse me, 25, 46, He says that the wicked will go away into eternal punishment. That is, it never ends. It is a place of unquenchable fire. The place where God administers holy wrath to the wicked. Many people think that hell is a place where Satan has a pitchfork and he's poking bad guys in the back. My friends, God is in hell administering judgment, administering justice. And I don't want you to go there. So flee the wrath which is to come. Flee! Flee! 
Flee God's justice before it is too late. And we are without hope. As I read there from Romans 3, no, no one can be justified before God by trying to keep His law. No man, no woman, no child can be good enough to enter to the kingdom of God. In fact, just this past Tuesday on October 31st was a very special day. It was the 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. 500 years ago, a man by the name of Martin Luther pinned his 95 theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, thus starting the Protestant Reformation, which was a group of men and women who stood upon the authority of the Bible against what the Catholic Church said and said salvation is by grace. Salvation is by grace. It is not by your works that you are justified. And it is all for the glory of God. And we derive such doctrines from the Holy Scriptures. And this was in contradiction to what the Catholic Church had taught and still teaches today. That salvation is a mix of faith and works. That salvation is partly the work of man. And they deny the authority of Scripture. That, that the church itself gives the authority to Scripture instead of Scripture itself carrying the authority with it. Praise God for the Reformation. Praise God that God raised up those men and women to stand upon the authority of His Word. So let no man deceive you concerning this doctrine. For if any man preaches another gospel to you, or if anyone tells you another means of salvation other than grace, other than the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, such a person is anathema. They are accursed. So we are without hope. However, I have great news, my friends, that God, before the world was created in eternity past, the triune God sent out to save a people unto Himself to save His people from their sins. To save His elect. The Father chose His people for glory. He set them apart for life. He chose the church before the world was even created. And He commissioned the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, He commissioned His Son to come and to die for these people. And Christ obeyed that charge. And when the fullness of the times came, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus became man. And He dwelt among men. And in His perfect life, He fulfilled the law of God as I mentioned earlier. Matthew 5, 17. He says, I did not, I came, or excuse me, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So He lived in perfect obedience to the commands of God as they are given in the Scriptures. He obeyed the commands that we broke and that we still this day break. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he loved his neighbor as himself. Truly God, truly man, the eternal Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious one, humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. How glorious is God's grace as it is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians 2, He says, verse 5, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied Himself, taking the form of a bond servant, and being made in the likeness of sinful men. Being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus Christ not only lived for His people, but He died for them. Paul exhorts the husbands in Ephesus in Ephesians 5.25. He says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. Friends, the love that God manifested at the cross was a great love. 
It is an eternal, infinite, perfect love. It is an agape love. Christ laid Himself down upon the cross as the Lamb of God, and He bore the guilt of the people of God. He took ownership of the sins of His people. He took ownership of their guilt. He became accountable to the Father for the sins of vile, wretched people. And the wrath of the Father was spent on Christ. It was unleashed on Christ. It was poured out on Christ. Isaiah 53, which was written about 700 years before Jesus Christ had walked the earth, speaks in very, very clear detail of the work of Jesus. It says in verse 4, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before it shears. So he did not open his mouth. Verse 10, But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Jesus Christ upon the cross paid for the sins of the people of God and satisfied the holy wrath of the Father. Not a drop out, not an ounce left. It is all gone, put away, paid for. Salvation has been accomplished for the people of God. So run to Christ. Do not delay any longer. Do not continue in sin anymore. Come, come ye who are weary and heavy laden, and Christ Jesus will give you rest. But my friends, not only did He die, but He was raised on the third day. He was raised as the public display, as the public declaration that the Father received His work, that He had received the atoning sacrifice of His Son as the perfect, sufficient payment for sin, that Christ had truly bought salvation, that His sacrifice was well-pleasing in the sight of the Father. And He is alive today, never to die again. Hallelujah! Christ Jesus is alive. Heaven's gates are open wide. Salvation is freely offered because Jesus Christ paid the infinite price. And after 40 days, Christ bodily ascended into heaven and He sat down in heaven. Something that a high priest was never supposed to do. However, Christ has done the work of redemption. It is complete. It is put away. No works ought to be added to it. It is in itself sufficient. Hebrews 1.3 says, and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high and Christ reigns as King, as Lord of the universe. And what you must do, O sinner, what you must do, O vile sinner, is you must repent and believe in the Gospel. Repentance is simply a brokenness over sin. You must be broken over your sin before God. Be disgusted with yourself and endeavor to flee that sin. Endeavor to turn away from it. 
You must turn from your pornography and your drunkenness, your drug abuse, your pride. You must turn away from your hatred. You must turn away from your love of pleasure rather than your love for God. You must turn away from these things and you must believe the Gospel. Belief is simply confidence in the promises of God. Confidence in what God has said to be true. For that is how Abraham was saved. Paul says in Romans 4.3, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed that God could save him, and he would be saved. And friends, that is what you must do. You must repent and believe that God can save you. That God can pardon you. That Jesus Christ did the work for you on your behalf, in your room, in your stead, in your place. And for all who repent and believe the Gospel, God will forgive them of their sin. And He will wrap them in the righteousness of Christ. All sin, past, present, and future, will be pardoned on account of the work of Christ upon the cross. And they will be credited. You will be credited if you, if you repent and believe. You will be credited with having lived Jesus' life. That is, you will be considered righteous, perfect, because Jesus Christ actually was righteous and perfect. Jesus takes my sin and I get His righteousness. Jesus takes my filthy rebellion upon Himself, takes ownership of it, and I receive His perfect righteousness as a gift of grace. The Father looks at me as if I lived Christ's life because He looked at Christ as if He lived my life. That is the glorious exchange of the Gospel. The great exchange the glorious exchange. And it is all of grace. All of grace. Ephesians 2 says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved. It is all by grace. And I want to say this, for those of you who go to church, those of you who are involved in church, those of you who are perhaps deacons or pastors in churches, my exhortation to you is to examine yourself to see whether you know Christ truly. For there are many people who say they know Jesus Christ, but they are liars. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name and in Your name cast out demons and in Your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, the one who has been truly saved by God's grace will have a new nature, a new heart with new desires. The Holy Spirit will have changed them. In fact, Jesus said in John 3.3, 3, Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When someone is saved by God, they are born again. They are recreated. They are a new creation. They will no longer live in sin. They will no longer live in the way that they used to live. They will now walk in holiness and righteousness before God because God has done a work in them. Because God has changed them. Because God has raised them to spiritual life. I can think back to my own conversion when God saved me. For eight years I had said I was a Christian, but I lived as a hypocrite, saying that I knew Christ, but I did not know Him. I didn't live for Him. I didn't care anything about holiness or the Word of God or prayer or sharing the Gospel. Instead, I was just some worldly, vile, wretched hypocrite. A drunkard, a drug abuser, sexually immoral. 
And I thought I was a Christian because I said I was a Christian. I was a liar. I was a liar, friends. And many of you are liars. Saying that you know Christ. And you may attend church and your pastor may approve of your Christianity. But it is not Christianity according to Scripture. It's a pseudo-Christianity. It's a false Christianity. It's a Christianity that will damn rather than save. And such people ought to be pitied. When God saves someone, they are radically changed. Everything about them is changed. Their thoughts, their intentions, their desires, their works. They now work. They now bear fruit. They now love the Word of God and love holiness because they have been changed. It is not that salvation is by works. Salvation is by grace. But the result of salvation, the result of salvation is that you will have works in your life to prove your conversion. You will have works in your life to validate the faith that you claim to possess. So works are not the cause, but the result of salvation. You must understand that, friends. And if you do not love Christ and you do not obey Christ, it's because Jesus never did a work in you. You can say all you want. You can talk however you want. But you know not Christ. And you're better off saying that you do not know Jesus. Saying that you're not a Christian. Rather than trampling Jesus' name underfoot. Rather than blaspheming Christ. And making His power seem as if it is no power at all. Making the name of Christ dishonored. Dragging His name through the mud. And so therefore you must repent and believe the gospel. But if you do look at your life and you say, God has done a work in me. God has raised me to spiritual life. And I do bear fruit of conversion. Then praise be to God. Praise be to God, my brother and, or sister in Christ. If that is the case, then what you must do is rest in the gospel this day. Feed upon the gospel of Jesus Christ this day. Feed upon it as your manna from heaven. For it is, my friends, it is our daily bread. Abide in the Gospel. And then go and share it with this lost, dying, perverse, and wicked world. It is all by grace, friends. All by grace. Ultimately, so that God gets all the glory. Ultimately, that God receives all the glory and the praise and the honor and the worship and the exaltation and the adoration. All things ultimately have been made for God's glory to bring God the glory. So friends, come to Christ that you might bring God glory. Repent that you might bring God glory. Be found in the Lord Jesus Christ that you might bring God the glory. Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, he says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all glory and praise and honor in all things. Amen. You who are lost, come and have life in the Lord Jesus Christ. You who say that you know Christ, examine yourselves to see whether you truly do. And if so, praise be to God. But if not, the call is still the same. Repent and believe the Gospel. My brethren, feed upon the Gospel and then share it with this lost, perverse, dying world. For they desperately need it. And do so by the grace of God for the glory of God. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, that the law of God brings about the knowledge of sin. And that we ourselves, my friends, we've also seen that we ourselves have broken this law of God, deserve hell for our sins. We are sinners in the hands of an angry God. But God in His mercy sent His Son into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. He died and rose again. And all who run to Jesus Christ will be saved by the grace of God and for the glory of God. So may Jesus Christ be glorified in all things. Truly in all things. 
forever and ever. Amen and amen.